Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, regular meeting of the Morro Bay Public Works Advisory Board for Wednesday, August 19th, 2020. All members of the, all six members of the board are present, so we do have a quorum. Are there any uh, members of the board that have a, uh, an announcement or presentation? I'll, I'll mention first that we do have a, a long, a couple long items, so we can be as brief as possible on our um, extra um, comments and things tonight and questions. Seeing no, um, no person indicating that, no board member indicating they need to uh, announce anything, we'll go to public comment period. On the uh, public comment period, um, if you are on a computer, you can use the raise your hand symbol. And this will be for public participation on items that are not on the agenda. Um, and if you're on the telephone, then you would use uh, press nine in order, star nine in order to raise your hand. Zeke, do we have anybody in the queue? Well, there are two people in the queue. Uh, one person is, does not, they don't have their hand raised, but it, they, it looks like they're active. Okay. So it, shall we call, may be for the agenda items then. Shall we call on Doug Rogers? Are you online? Do you want to speak? No, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, Doug, Doug is a participant or a board member. Well, then yep. he should be on Thank the other side. We should promote him to a panelist. Let's do that. Oh, I thought he was there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then... Do I press star nine if I want to say something? Well, at this point, uh, we're going to promote you to the panelist side. Okay. Okay, that's fine. But, I, you know, I can be on mute or whatever. Yeah, well, you can still mute yourself on the other side. So... Um, right. There, if it, you're not um, haven't been called on, then using the mute button will help facilitate everything. So it does not appear that we have any um, uh, public comment period. So I'll close public comment, and then we'll go to our regular agenda items. The consent agenda. We have approval of the minutes for. June 17th, 2020. Are there any comments from the board members um, on the uh, consent agenda? And if there are no comments, then would someone make a motion to approve the as presented? Please. Rick, I have one, I have one item. Okay. Uh, I just asked for the city council, I think the work plan, you know, the last couple of meetings, we've talked about what we're supposed to be doing here and I, I don't see it on the agenda. So I'm just asking what happened to that. On, on the minutes you mean? Well, on the agenda. I mean, I thought we were supposed to have some kind of a work plan and it doesn't seem to be on the agenda. So it hasn't been, and it is, I don't know if it will be. So I'm just asking when and if, so that's all. That's okay. my question. Um, Janine, are you able to uh, respond to that or another member of staff as to, uh, I think we do have a work plan that had been presented some months ago. And if we do, then that should be forwarded to um, Doug. And if we are not then maybe we should try to get a uh, uh see where that's going to be placed on the agenda staff members hi this is uh rob Leibig, city engineer um i'll work with the um jen calloway our interim public works director to see if we should put something on the um agenda based on council direction thank you robert Okay, is there a motion to approve the uh, consent agenda item A1, 
the minutes of June seventeenth. Um, I'll make I'll make a motion, Rick. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second that motion. It's been seconded by Chris. All those in favor of approving the make the minutes as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 All those aye. All those opposed say nay. Okay, the motion passes. Business item one, the director's report. And um, because we do have a long meeting, unless you have some really specific items that you need to um, present, Jan's, Jan, I believe, is going to be presenting the uh, director's report. Um, let's try to move it along. So staff member that's going to do the director's report. Uh, this is Rob Leibach again. Um, um, I will be um, fielding any questions and uh, directing traffic on the director's report, but uh, we have really no presentation. We'd like to get to our other um, business items as quickly as possible. Um, so if there's any questions, we would um, um, answer those, but we don't plan on a line by line, page by page um, discussion of the director's report tonight. Okay, any members? Okay. Rob, or let's see, we'll start with John. Do you have any questions on the director's report? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I was looking at the uh, uh, page 595, staff local crews cut back, cleared all vegetation and trees from South Pound or South Bay Boulevard bike lanes. Is that going to also be done in nor on North Main Street? I noticed that the, the uh, southbound lane there is always kind of a dicey thing for bikes to go down um i'll let our maintenance uh, supervisor answer that question matt bishop well there we go okay good evening i'm matt bishop maintenance supervisor here with more bay and uh good evening chair members of the staff or members of the board and staff as well i um you're, you're speaking about Main Street right there, just on um, the north north end of town? North Main Street, yeah. North but Main Street. You, you know, you, what, you got about two and a half feet of bike lane there, and it gets kind of hard for bikes to to, to drive down, ride down there. I was wondering if, if there's any sort of regular maintenance of that, uh, or is that the state, uh, state's responsibility? Now, if it's in the if it's in that uh, the area down Maine through all the island streets, we would hit that. If it's beyond your uh, Yerba Buena, uh, then that would be the uh, Caltrans. You no, know, I'm just talking. You know, so it's it's between it's between Atascadero Road and Yerba Buena is, is you know that that whole. Sure, sure. So we would get out there and maintain that as best as we could. You bet. Uh, okay. Do you see? Do you see any problems uh, on that area? It, it could use. It could. It could you use a good weed weed whacker? Okay. Along this pace of the fence. Oh, the fence side. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We we will plan that out. We we typically do that once a year, uh, and that that right there has uh, has been overgrown. It's it's time. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. Okay. Uh, next question is on 10 of 95 from Damaris. Yes, I'm here. Um, does that production, does that also include the water we, which we get from the state water project? Yes, it does. It's all of our production. We haven't been, um, it's all state water actually right now. Okay. Yeah. Just sort of curious. Yeah. Uh, then on 11 of 95, it's got the uh, uh, Tidelands Park Stormwater Pocket Park. Is that to clean up storm stormwater or something for the stormwater pollution prevention aid? Yes, it, it takes in um, some of the boat wash drainage area and then some other just runoff area there. Uh, pretty small little watershed that goes into that basin there. Um, gets cleaned in the bioretention area and then uh, goes back out underneath the street and goes out to the bay. So yeah, the, the little park has a stormwater feature to it. Okay. Um, 
Next one is uh, for Joe or John Gunderlock. Uh, no, not that one. Never mind. Uh, okay, Rob, it's your turn. Sure. Um, is there a schedule for the uh replacement project? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that. You broke up just as uh, before a replacement project. Yeah, it was Sequoia Storm Drain Repair Replacement. And you've got uh, in-house design. Is there a schedule for it, or is it kind of like as, as labor is identified? As labor is identified and budget is identified. So so it's still, there is no real schedule for that one. Same, same thing for Laurel Eastman? Same thing for Laurel Eastman. Uh, what what will happen if, if we don't get those things repaired reasonably quick? Um, erosion downstream, probably damage to the street surface um, without a repair. Okay. Does, it, does uh, Jen know about that yet? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we've got maybe three months to get something done, right? Uh, three months to get something done. Uh, we may be able to get in there with a patch uh, if we're going to try to get it done within the next three months. But uh, for the larger project, um, um, it's probably a longer term, lar larger project. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then on page 17 or 95, uh, where's the Harbor View Hotel? Um, at the bottom of Harbor um, and Front Street. Um, so it's just come in for just started review. Okay. Uh, and has the Coast Guard deigned to share any schedule for uh, their remodel or addition or whatever they're calling it? Um, they had a schedule to start in September. I think they've had some delays um, and haven't heard lately when they plan on starting that. Okay. And then last is, uh, I was looking at the One Water report for the work, and you, the, the construction and finance costs seem to be kind of mixed together on page 18 of 95. Projected budget, and I was wondering uh, half that cost is is budget, or is is the finance cost? Is that is that a rough assumption for how those That's uh, a projected assumption? Approximately, um, these are all construction costs um, here. There's no debt service cost in there. We're not including interest, but about half the project is um, debt service. Yeah, well, I'm just looking at that. So the total program budget is 130,000. Uh, that's probably could be labeled better. It's uh, uh, total hard and soft costs, not including the cost of money. So there's no interest in there. Okay. So that includes the work too, then. Yes. Work. Okay. All right. Those are my questions. All right, thank you, John. Um, next, I'll go to Jan. Do you have any questions on the uh, staff report? I just have uh, something that I was sort of concerned about. On page seven, just a definition I need to clear. On page seven, you said you they, uh, on the waste, on the water thing, you located and marked 100 underground service alerts. And then later in the list, it says that there were seven potential water leaks that were investigated. So I want to know how do underground service alerts differ from potential water leaks? And if they're un just marked, does that mean that it's just you're keeping your eye on it, it's going to happen soon? Anyway, that's just... How, how do service alerts differ from water leaks? So a USA, this is Joe Miller, the utilities manager. Okay. So uh, a USA marking is anytime you're doing any any type of work, be it a contractor or a homeowner uh, that's 
kind of in in the on the underground area. So you'd call in before you do that work. You'd call in and request the utilities to be marked. Okay. So, uh, we don't really know what type of work a lot of times is being done in that area. You know, it could be a homeowner wanting to plant a tree. So, okay, that answers it right there. Okay, thank you. Yep. And as a reminder for everybody, if you are doing work, remember to call. 811 before you do that underground work so uh, those underground utilities can be marked and uh, uh, you don't cause any damage to the utilities or hurt yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, Tori, do you have any uh, questions on the director's report? Um, I'd just like to follow up on John's uh, question about the WERF spending and so um, we had mentioned at the last meeting here, a PWAB meeting, about the process of the contractor, both contractors, Carrillo, as well as down the one who's building the project, um, whether or not they're being reviewed versus um, the, the actual the actual invoice items to uh, the estimated cost items, especially in light of the 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 cost overrun that was essentially given at the last meeting. Um, it, it, can you just talk about the review process that's going on in the financial office there at the city, paying the bills to the um, to the contractor regarding whether or not there um, there's a there's a, a higher expense on some of the the estimates or not. I, I realize that last. Well, can you just speak to that? I guess is there any kind of review auditing of expenditures and evaluation if the the actual expenditures were at this time higher than what were estimated in the contract so on the, the construction work um, it starts with the contractor preparing an invoice a pay estimate that's transmitted to our construction manager he reviews that against the work actually performed um, it goes to Corolla's offices to review against the contract amount and then to um, city finance for review, then to um, um, Joe Miller for final approval. Um, on the consultant invoices follows uh, a similar pathway. Um, they go through first um, program management review, city finance review, and then um, Joe's review and approval. Is is the um, so the the any is there any distinction of a uh, a higher cost than what was estimated that's made at this time in those processes that you just described, or does that just come kind of at the very end, you know, of the construction process, and you just add up what was actually spent to and compare it to what was actually estimated, and then that's when you see there's been a higher or lower uh, actual expenditure. So the um, the construction project is a um, the WERF project is what is known as a guaranteed maximum price, and it's guaranteed for the the scope that uh, they're going to build. So these change orders um, increase the guaranteed maximum price, but they also increase the scope. So we only pay um, for items that are approved in that contract and we pay only up to the amount that the the contractor has put in as a bid so it's an open book process where we review all of their costs um, and um, their own they can only charge um, the cost of tech what it costs them to do the work um, plus their overhead and profit is um, the um, the way that contract works. And for consultant contract, we have a scope of work. Um, we review the 
The charges against that scope of work um, generally don't pay for out of scope items um, unless it's been um, there are, you know, some things that we're working on a change order on that we need to proceed forward with that um, may get invoiced prior to um, um, authorizing that change if there's sufficient budget in those consultant contracts. Okay, well, not, notwithstanding the change orders that were made, but just looking at sort of the original uh, contracted amount not to be exceeded, there was, uh, to my understanding per our discussion last time, that there there was a, uh, a percentage increase that was allowed to the to the contractor and the builder if if the actual construction date start dark start date uh, happened beyond 12 months of the original contract. So that's what I'm asking if there's if those on those prices uh, if there's some distinction at at some point that we can see uh, that 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 allowance for a cost overrun had gone into effect and we're, we're paying the, the higher price that that was that was allowed under the contract. That contract provision was formalized with a, um, a contract change order. So it is now inside the contract. Uh, wow. So it's um, it's not an automatic um, increase. It has to be uh, a neg finalized through a negotiated change order and approved by city council. Okay. Um, That's so what how many change orders? How many change orders have there now been? Uh, in the neighborhood of sixty individual change orders, I believe, Joe. I'm, I, yeah, I'm not, it's approximately it's up around sixty six, I believe, right now is where we're at. And it, and how, what's the total dollar amount to the, that? Uh, I'd have to look that up. Yeah, I, I don't have that at my fingertips right at the moment. Uh, okay. What well, was it like? 10 I, can, I can look that up as we're talking here. Um, the, the actual number and the total dollar amount. Say it again. Um, Mr. Caceres is going to look up that number while we're having this discussion, and he'll get back. Okay. okay. All right. I have no more questions. All right. Thank you. Um, Let's see, Doug. Do you have any questions? You know, it might take. No, I'm I'm okay. I'm listening. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see, Chris. How about yourself? Do you have any questions on the staff report? No, I'm good at the staff report. I do not. I'm good at this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and. Uh, see there's no action that needs to be taken on the director's report so we can um, move on to the next item of, of business which would be b2 the water reclamation facility project hydrological report characterization and selection of the project area for june 2020 who gets to uh, field this one first? Uh, I'll introduce the item and then turn it over to the project team for uh, presentation, and that'll be followed by, you know, questions and discussion. So um, this item is uh, the next step in the process to um, identify and um, further refine the um, area for indirect potable reuse groundwater injection um, and um, starting back in um, prior to 2017 with um, um, hydrogeologists um, have identified this is the most um, uh, advantageous way to use reclaimed water for the city of Morro Bay and this is the next step in that process to ultimately get us to a, a permit through 
State Department of Water um, Resources Division of Drinking Water, which permits these. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Eric Caceres of Corolo, and uh, he'll kick off. And then we have um, team members from GSI Water who will be um, also assisting with the presentation. Thank you. everybody. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, hold on real quickly as I pull up the presentation and we share it. Okay. There we go. Okay. Great. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, staff, uh, Eric Caceres, the city's um, work program manager. Uh, thank you for, let me minimize this here quickly. Thank you for having me here uh, this evening to discuss item B2, uh, which is um, an update on the state of the hydrogeology work that's currently being done um, in support of the work project. I'm going to give a brief presentation. Uh, and then I have two members of um, GSI Water, uh, who is our project hydrogeologist, who uh, will be available to answer any questions. Uh, we have Tim Thompson uh, and, and David O'Rourke. So as I mentioned, I'm going to go through this um, relatively quickly, uh, and because and, I know we've got a lot to get through uh, here this evening. Uh, just a little bit of background. Um, so the city's taking a phased approach to the hydrogeological work that's needed to support um, potable reuse. And, and there's a number of phases uh, that have been identified, uh, a total of four phases. Um, we have essentially phase zero. We went back and named um, kind of the feasibility work uh, that was done previously as phase zero. Um, we have phase one uh, and we have phase two and phase three. So the feasibility work has been completed. Uh, the phase one work, the additional modeling was completed and phase two uh, is what we are discussing here tonight, which has essentially been completed as well. Uh, and, and before we jump into kind of the phase two work, which is what we're here to discuss tonight, uh, and that's the report that was included in the staff report, I do wanna kind of go over um, the previous two phases uh, to describe what those findings were, because these really these phases build on each other uh, and then finally, when we get to phase three, which is essentially the basis of design uh, for the full-scale injection wells, um, the hydrogeological work uh, will have been completed. So phase zero focused on establishing feasibility of potable reuse. So there's been a number of questions uh, by folks, members of the public, about the feasibility uh, of potable reuse. And so just to, to draw a bit of a timeline, as Rob mentioned, um, there was a couple of reports that were completed back in uh, 2016 and 2017. First, the facility master plan uh, that kind of set the stage for what the, um, the water reclamation facility was ultimately going to look like. Uh, and then the city went out and looked and said, um, well, we want to produce recycled water. Um, what is the best way to, uh, to, to utilize that recycled water? And for uh, several reasons in terms of um, the, the, um, uh, the water supply benefit to the community and uh, the cost effectiveness. Um, the uh, mass reclamation plan that was completed in 2017 uh, said that uh, potable reuse, indirect potable reuse was the way to go. And so very quickly after that, um, the city worked with GSI to complete a feasibility study uh, to determine uh, if that was a, a, a feasibility. So as part of that feasibility work that was completed in May, 2017, uh, the groundwater model was developed and uh, the team in that document determined that yes potable reuse uh, is feasible uh, and the definition of that feasibility has to do with uh, the underground travel time uh, once water is injected so um, the division of drinking water has a number of different requirements that must be met to be able to um, to use recycled water in this way um, we've got a number of different treatment uh, requirements that we are taking care of with uh, at the water reclamation facility, but once the water gets in the ground, it needs to be in the ground for two months, a uh, minimum of two months before we can extract it. So that's what the feasibility study looked at and determined that uh, at two different sites, both uh, one west of 
Highway 1 in, in uh, property currently owned by Vistra and then property east of Highway 1 uh, in private property. Those are the two areas that were looked at um, that this minimum two-month travel time can be met. Um, further, that feasibility study determined that a total of 825 acre feet per year could be injected into the groundwater. Um, that equates to essentially 100% of, uh, of, of the average production um, of, of, from the treatment plant. Uh, on an annual basis. So um, the, this is average, on the average condition, if the city were to take all of the water and run it through the treatment process, uh, it could inject it into the ground ultimately. Um, it also looked at how much could be extracted uh, and up to uh, 1,200 acre feet per year could be extracted. So more than, uh, than what could be injected. Uh, and, and, that, and then the barrier to that is induction of any uh, seawater intrusion and impairing uh, groundwater quality. So that's phase zero or the feasibility study. Uh, then we had phase one that was completed by GSI back in uh, April of 2019. Uh, and, and phase one looked at uh, a couple of different things. Uh, it's been dubbed additional modeling um, because essentially that's what was being done at the time. Um, a little bit of this work was spurred by work that was done as part of one water plan um, in, in wanting to know um, what would be the long-term impacts of this injection and extraction on, uh, on the groundwater quality in the Lower Moro Groundwater Basin? So uh, the Lower Moro Groundwater Basin uh, has had uh, um, long-term issues with nitrates in that groundwater basin. So the water currently extracted from the groundwater basin needs to be treated before it goes into the city's uh, potable water supply. And so uh, one of the things we wanted to look at was um, does that – does that issue improve or get worse or stay the same uh, with long-term injection and extraction? And, and uh, it was uh, concluded that uh, injection and extraction would improve groundwater quality. And another important question that was answered, something that was raised in the one water plan, um, you know, why doesn't the city just pump more groundwater? Uh, it, it, it is permitted to pump more groundwater. And uh, we looked at that in this study and determined that if the city were to pump significantly more groundwater than it currently does, um, that over a period of time, you would start to induce seawater intrusion, you know, essentially re uh, changing the groundwater gradient, uh, and, and you would lead to uh, salinity issues uh, with the groundwater. So that's what phase one uh, focused on. And again, that was completed back in April 2019. And I will say for folks on uh, that are folks from, that are that are watching this uh, remotely, uh, and to uh, members of the Public Works Advisory Board, both of these documents are available on. Uh, the project website, uh, the feasibility study, and the phase one report. So that's a, a little bit of background on uh, two documents that have been uh, presented to um, to this PWAB and the city council. Now we'll get into the current work efforts. So um, phase three, or excuse me, phase two is what we started following phase one in, uh, in, in 2019, uh, a summary of the tasks that were completed. Uh, first, we gathered some additional information uh, in, in the form of completion of field studies, and I'll get into each one of these a little bit uh, as we move forward. Um, we updated the existing groundwater model, um, and then ultimately um, the, the overall goal of this task, um, selection of the preferred injection location, uh, and, and that's what we'll be talking a little bit more about here tonight. Uh, and then the other thing was better define uh, project feasibility. So because of the improvements that had been made to the model, uh, with the additional information that had been added, um, we were be a bit better able to get better resolution on uh, on the actual travel times uh, that the model was predicting in, in the groundwater. Um, this picture off here to the right is, uh, is, a, is a cone penetration test machine, uh, and, and we'll get into that here in a second because that was one of the tools that we used uh, to better characterize what was going on under the ground uh, as part of phase two. <laughs> So as I mentioned previously, field work uh, was completed to better characterize the aquifer. Um, and so at this point in time, uh, we are still we were still looking at two different injection areas. Again, one east of Highway 1 and then one west of Highway 1. Um, the graphic over here to the right shows the west injection area and the different components that were uh, involved in some of the testing that was, uh, that was done as part of this phase of the work. Um, in the Narrows area, or, or excuse me, in the East area, are also called the Narrows area. Uh, we performed these uh, cone penetration tests uh, back in April of last year. Uh, we also installed a piezometer 
uh, and, and installed a monitoring well, and then actually did some pump testing of an existing city well uh, that was located in the area. And um, the folks from GSI can answer some additional questions on that uh, after we get through this presentation, if anybody has any specific questions on, uh, on the specifics of the pump testing. On the West Injection area, we installed uh, a piezometer as well, which is essentially a, a, a level monitoring device. And we also did uh, pump testing uh, using an existing well uh, that's owned by the Morro Bay Mutual Water Company, um, kind of in the center of that graphic there, the Morro Bay Mutual Water Company well number three um, is, what we, uh, is what was used for that pump testing. Uh, and as a result of the pump testing, it was determined that injection rates are higher in the west area uh, as opposed to the east area. So we could actually put more water into the ground uh, on, on the west side of Highway 1. Um, the existing model was updated based on field work. So we, in, uh, we, in, we uh, didn't go through the specific uh, retention time results, uh, groundwater retention times results um, that we identified in the feasibility study. Um, but this was our, our really our second opportunity, um, or our first opportunity since the feasibility study to better refine uh, those retention time numbers. And so as a result of adding the additional data, into the model that we gained from the field work that I just talked about. Um, we were able to run the model and found that retention times had uh, significantly increased, uh, especially for the high school wells uh, number one and two. Uh, a, a lot of the results that were gained from the feasibility study, again, um, the model was not as sophisticated as it was during this, this point in time. Um, we identified travel times that were in the two, three, and four months, and you can see those travel times have uh, have gone up pretty uh, pretty significantly. Um, we have now landed on uh, the west injection area being the preferred injection location. Um, and truthfully, uh, as we've been going through this analysis, um, we wanted to obviously keep our options open on both the west and east side. Um, but what bore out from the analysis um, was what we had hoped for was that the west injection area would be preferred. Uh, and maybe I'll skip down to the bottom bullet, is um, you know, I'm not a hydrogeologist um, by any means. And so, um, but what I do understand is uh, it is, is running pipelines and, and the cost of doing so. And we knew that the West injection area was going to be more cost effective. It was going to be cheaper to get the water to the West injection area based on where our current pipeline, uh, pipeline alignment is. Um, so we were always hoping that the West area was going to pan out, and, and thankfully it did. Um, the reasons for that area being selected as a preferred area, uh, it's got higher uh, injection rates um, due to the transmissivity. Um, that, was, that information was gained, again, from the pump testing that was done on both sides of the freeway. Uh, we had longer retention times um, on the west side than we did on the east side. Longer retention times means um, easier to permit with the division of drinking water. Uh, we saw a greater mitigation uh, of, of potential seawater intrusion. So we create a, a, a more effective buffer on the west side uh, to protect uh, the groundwater from uh, intrusion of, of seawater. Uh, and and, and um, while we are still dealing with some uh, property acquisition issues on the west side of the freeway, um, we do know that it, 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 we, we, we know that easier implement it's going to be easier to implement on the west side. Um, we're dealing with an open, non-residential area um, versus uh, trying to implement something on the east side uh, where we would have to uh, acquire um, a residential property uh, that's currently being used for, uh, for other things. So um, those, those are the rationale uh, that are further detailed in the report for why the West Injection Area is preferred. So as an additional um, scope task, after finishing uh, and, and identifying the preferred injection location and as we were going through and updating the report, one of the things that we asked uh, GSI to look at in a little bit more detail was, um, uh, was, was what was, what was the travel, uh, uh, traveling, uh, tra additional travel time um, that we could realize uh, if we were to look at a phased implementation and what I mean by phased implementation is um, the feasibility study indicated that we can inject a total of 825 acre feet or essentially all the water uh, that, that's going to be received at the new wastewater treatment plant. Um, but we have been in discussions with DDW. Um, the city of Morro Bay is a relatively small agency 
um, as it pertains to, to agencies that are that are trying to uh, implement this type of project. And so that we, we know that the longer um, groundwater retention times that we can bring and show to, to Division of Drinking Water, the more confidence they're going to have uh, in, uh, in the project and the easier it will be to initially uh, permit it. So um, we did have GSI run some additional model runs. Uh, again, this information wasn't included in the staff report and the report that's in the staff report because we still are um, refining this and it still is in a, in a draft phase, but I didn't want to uh, to just to just show this that uh, we are looking at some um, uh, some different scenarios, uh, looking at a, a reduced uh, injection volume initially, uh, and you can kind of see um, on the left and right. Um, the left is the uh, table that will look familiar from the previous slide and is in the staff report. The table on the right is one that was generated based on the work that has been recently completed by GSI, uh, and as you can see, where we're looking at. You know, six and seven and a half and four uh, months of travel time uh, for high school world one and two. Um, the minimum travel times are increasing into the uh, seven, eight, and nine range. Um, which, uh, again, if we can bring an initial project to DDW um, to permit that shows longer retention times, uh, that's going to be uh, beneficial um, for permitting the project. Mm -hmm. In terms of next steps, um, we are moving into phase three, um, and uh, that phase three work uh, is, is essentially ready to begin. Um, for all intents and purposes, GSI has uh, has ex expended their budget and, uh, and met the requirements in their scope of work, um, and it's now time to move on to uh, pilot injection testing, um, and that will begin with construction of a full-scale injection well. Uh, on, uh, on, on the Vistra site once we are able to, uh, to do that. Um, we were not able to use the existing Vistra well. That's the figure that's shown here to the right. Um, there's an existing Morro Bay uh, Mutual Water Company well that's located on the Vistra property. And unfortunately, um, because of the condition of that well, uh, we were not able to use that for pilot ejection testing. Um, so our plan is to uh, permit and uh, construct a new full-scale injection well that we'll use for pilot testing, and in the future, uh, we will use for uh, full-scale uh, injection. Um, GSI is also going to be lending some support to our permitting effort with uh, Division of Drinking Water. The main uh, permitting document that we have to produce uh, for this effort is the Title 22 Engineering Report. We have an initial draft of that document um, that doesn't include a lot of the hydrogeological information. Uh, that we've submitted to a division of drinking water. There's plenty of other things that they need to look at, uh, including things that we're going to talk about here in item uh, B3. Um, so uh, GSI is going to be helping us with that permitting effort. Uh, and then a development of design criteria for the overall injection well system. So a network of injection wells uh, that will get us our initial injection volume and then the full 825 acre foot per year uh, injection capacity. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, at this time, uh, entertain questions and uh, and discussion. Okay, um, let's go in reverse order this time. Uh, Chris, um, do you have any uh, questions for Eric? Honestly, not at this time. You're okay. And how about you, Doug? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, good. I just would like some help understanding a uh, page uh, 47 of 95 and 49 of 95. The dry condition, you know, the, I guess it's the underground flow of water, you know, and I, I'm not real familiar with how this works, but I, I just want you to please elaborate on what what does that mean, a ground water, ground water flow direction? You know, under dry conditions. So I, I just want to hear more about what that means. Um, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, this is Dave O'Rourke um, from GSI. I, I I can't see exactly what you're referring to, but I'll tell you what I think you're referring to. The black to. arrow. The black arrows. Okay. Well. Uh, groundwater flow direction is, you know, basically it, it's just like surface water. It flows downhill, right? 
flows from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. So when you inject water into those wells, you know, it flows away from the wells. And what we were always keeping an eye on the groundwater flow direction at the coast, because if you see groundwater flow direction coming from the coast toward the wells, that's indicative of conditions that could uh, uh, allow, you know, seawater intrusion um, from right. from the ocean. Right. That's okay. So that's you should, I guess on page forty-seven, it's talking about dry conditions, but okay. it also talks about seventy-five percent injection rate. See, that's so. Could you just tell me what what, is, what do we what, what does that mean? Okay, um, we you know the aquifer here it the water levels uh, are pretty flashy. They go up and down, you know, a lot with from summer to winter, especially during a, an extended drought period. So if your water levels are lower as they would be after a three or four year drought then, you know, uh, you know, water level doesn't change much at the ocean. So if your water levels are lower for an, expen for an extended period of time, um, you know, that's going to, you're going to have conditions that could allow for seawater intrusion. Uh, okay. During the winter or during an extended wet period when those water levels or water elevations are higher, those conditions pretty much never happen. The water always flows toward the coast. Right. See, that, that's why, it, it, like figure 11, it talks about 25% injection. See, so I'm, I mean, we're, we're talking about 25% of the, the plant water. I think that we're talking like 200, what, acre feet, something like that, is the 25%. Right. So, and then, and, yeah. And the next they, issue, but let me just compare. The next one talks about 75% injection which would be something like 600 acre feet. And I just want to understand, is that is that what these charts are telling us? Okay, what that refers to is, uh, uh, I was trying to make it match up with the original feasibility model runs. And in that run, you know, there's a, the city's got a, a, a permitted amount of groundwater pumpage of something like 581 acre feet or 580 acre feet a year that they're allowed to pump, right? Yeah. That's right. that's the baseline pumpage. So then oh, I see. so then the 25% is that 580 plus 25% of 825, right? Cuz yeah. 825 is the full build out injection amount. Right. So that that's how those numbers are. The seventy five percent injection would be five eighty plus seventy five percent of uh, eight twenty five. Right. So that's how it adds up. So that's that's kind of like an even, almost even, really. Right. Uh, well, on this one, we're injecting. I think for all of these, uh, Dave, just if I can jump in real quick, I think for all of these scenarios here, we are injecting 825 acre feet, the total amount. What is varying here, what is varying here is um, the amount that's extracted. So baseline is equal to 500 and, uh, and, and 80 acre feet, I believe, uh, 581 acre feet plus seven, an additional 75%, which gets you to the 1,200 acre feet in this case. Uh, and, and then if you go to figure 11, uh, the, that pumping, it's the same injection, 825 acre feet, but I believe the pumping is the 581 acre feet plus an additional 25%, which gets you to the 787 acre feet. Yeah. So, I, and, and so correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but I think in all these scenarios, 825 is going in, and what we are varying is the amount of water that the city would be taking out for use. That's correct. So for that figure 10, they're actually extracting, you know, how, how much, you know, 400 acre feet more, 375 acre feet more than they're injecting. And also, when you go from 10 to 11, you're going from injection at the Narrows area down to injection at the Western area. So those are different model runs. 
But as far as the, the amounts, yes, Eric's correct. The injection was held constant at 825, so you know, pretty aggressive, but assuming full build out from the beginning. And then the amount that was recovered was varied. So it's 12 that really kind of concerns me, right? 47 of 95, page 47. That's all. I mean, there were, you're injecting 825 or, or, or the 75% injection. Does that mean you're not, you're only injecting 600 acre feet? No, 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 no the, 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 the baseline plus, plus 75% is that that's the that's the extraction rate again so under this scenario under figure 12 you are injecting 825 acre feet and you are extracting 1200 acre feet oh brother but but that's isn't that that's not going to happen i mean because obviously i'm concerned about seawater there but i you know i don't think that's an issue is it i don't think it's an issue well, I, I, so I, I, I just to just to jump in and bring some bring some um, uh, some points of reference to this, you know, I think GSI ran this, these scenarios like they did because the feasibility study identified the upper bounds of uh, of extraction at about 1,200 acre feet, and they ran most of the scenarios in the feasibility study, if not all the scenarios in the feasibility study, at 825 acre feet. So it gives you an apples and apples comparison between the feasibility study. And, and this report. And um, to your point, Doug, um, or, or maybe another point of reference is the city currently uses, you know, 1,000 to 1,100 acre feet per year of potable water. Um, but the one water plan projected that, uh, that number to go up to as high as like 1,400 acre feet per year. So mm -hmm. the city could be in a situation where, um, you know, it, it may want to, um, with the absence of, of state water or something else, it may want to extract up to 1,200 acre feet per year. Yeah. Well, all right. I mean, you know, so figure 12 is, is basically warning us that, 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 that we, we don't want to push it that far. Not, maybe not with that exact layout of wells or, you know, there's, there's a lot of variables that can go into it, but okay. yeah, it, this, yeah, this scenario does show that if you keep this, you know, as it's exactly as it's laid out there on the, on the figure, if you keep that up for a long period of time, you could see some seawater intrusion at those high school wells. Okay. Probably not so much at the Highway 1 wells there, the MB34, MB15, but the high school yeah. wells could see it. So, yeah, that's okay. exactly why we're doing this sort of thing, you know, to see what works and what we got to keep an eye out for. Okay. All right, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Next we'll go to uh, Tori. Do you have any questions at this time? I have two simple questions. One is um, the contour, the blue contours. What what exactly are are do they measure? Are they is that water pressure or density of water? As some kind of elevation or what is that? And then the second question: Did the injection a fenced in closed areas I, I'm particularly on the western side like it's very nice open space there I'm just wondering if that's going to have if the, the wells go there they, that whole space will remain sort of closed to the public or you know any other uses um, I answer the first question the blue contour lines Eric are, those are the water groundwater elevation line so it's strictly you know, where the elevation of the groundwater surface is. So, okay. simple so, question, simple answer there. So that's how you determine groundwater flow direction, right? Because like I said, it flows downhill. So you do those contour lines and it's just like looking at a topographic map, you know? You know, you know it's downhill when you go perpendicular to the contours. Same okay. thing with this groundwater flow direction. So is it is it um, a number of feet below ground level? No, it's feet. It's uh, elevation feet above mean sea level. Oh, 
I mean, when you go out there, you measure it as depth from groundwater, but that's not what we're displaying. It's 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 an elevation in feet above mean sea level. Okay. 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 And then uh, I, I missed part of the second question, but uh, wells would be constructed under, you know, flush mounted basically. There'd be vault boxes, I'm assuming, just like there is for a utility box on the street. So there won't be, I don't believe there will be, uh, you know, construction items that stick up above ground. You'd, I'm assuming there'd be a three by three or four by four vault box in the keep the equipment subsurface. Yeah, right, and, Eric? Yeah, just to follow up on that, we wouldn't anticipate having a, a large fenced off area, uh, but depending on the design of the wells, um, if, if, if you're familiar with what the well heads look like out uh, uh, at, at Kaiser Park, um, at Lila Kaiser Park, excuse me, um, there are some wells out there that are, are, are have a small pad uh, and a small uh, little chain link fence. It's probably a five foot by five foot square. Um, we may see something uh, similar to that. And then we're probably gonna have a small um, electrical building uh, out at the location. So a small electrical building, and then maybe these individual wellheads uh, that uh, have a five by five fence around them and they'll be spaced out, um, but we won't have this big, you know, quarantined off area um, where, where the wells are gonna be located. Okay. How, how many how many of the individual wells might you have, say, in the west area if you put them there? Um, I, I want to say from the analysis, we're probably looking at for to get the total capacity based on the work that we've done. I think it's probably a maximum of about five or six. Yeah, I would agree. It's, okay. it's on that order, five or six. Oh, something we'll like that. This is Tim Thompson. We'll know a lot more after we run our initial injection testing on the on that well that Eric mentioned in his presentation. Okay. Anything else, Tori? No, no thanks, Rick. All right, thank you. Um, Jan, do you have any questions at this time? Not at this time, Rick, thank you. Okay, John, how about yourself? Yeah, I got a few. Okay. Um, one of the questions I have is, would there be any water quality benefit if we injected a small amount of water in Arrows area to uh, encourage a groundwater movement in that area? The question is, would there be a water quality improvement uh, if, if we put some in at the Narrows area? Yes. Um, we, in that 2019 report, we did sort of an either or analysis, you know, either all at the Narrows or all at the Western site. Both improved water quality at the collection wells. Um, we didn't go to the detail of trying to, you know, analyze permutations where it might be half narrows, half western. So, no, I don't know the specific answer to that. Um, you know, uh, my, you know, one of, one of the main takeaways of the water quality modeling from 2019 to me was that the western site protected against water quality degradation from seawater intrusion significantly better, you know, than the Narrows area, which makes sense, right? Because the Narrows area is not between the collection wells and the ocean. So it provided very little protection against seawater intrusion. My, you know, the, the thought I was thinking was, do we have nitrates coming down through the narrows and is that going to be a, a water treatment process a groundwater treat treatment process required if we decide to reuse the water okay there is I, I, my understanding is there is nitrate coming down from the narrows area 
Uh, but the the western area, it provided, you know, essentially the same amount of protection against nitrate in the recovery wells as the Narrows area did, because basically you're sort of redirecting the whole groundwater flow direction instead of the natural gradient, which comes from the Narrows down toward the high, you know, the high school wells and the highway one wells. Uh, now, once you start injecting at the western side and pulling it in at those wells, you know, you're, you 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 create a little cell where all the water comes from the injection wells, and so you probably you do still get some incidental nitrate. Perhaps we I, I do recall you know running that, but it was not significant. Okay, so there, you see no point in in any sort of injection in the narrows just to to help improve water quality then? I don't uh, think so. Okay. Uh, what sort of groundwater treatment will be required for this water that we extract? Eric, that's you. Oh, well, I can take that. Yeah, or, or, or Tim, Tim can answer that as well. Yeah, uh, once the groundwater has been injected under the terms of the permit, and, the, and all the monitoring requirements are, are, are being met. Um, and then there's a lot of water quality goals established through the, the permitting process with the Division of Drinking Water. Um, that, that recycled water, which has been injected, is, be, is considered groundwater from that point forward because you've met all the water quality targets uh, both before injection and then once it's percolated through the aquifer. So that that actual that recycled water loses its its sort of tag, its label as being recycled water, and it, it is simply groundwater once you've met all the permitting requirements. So in terms of your question, there is no additional treatment required of that recovered groundwater any more than the existing groundwater, you know, uh, you know, uh, on on, uh, on online uh, chlorination and things like that. And that's the that that's the way the per, the permitting process works, where you've established that you've met all the public safety, public health, and water re, water quality goals, which are actually quite strict in, in the permitting process. And so that's, I know. Yeah, and I guess the question I have is: so we the current groundwater which we extract from that area. What is what treatment is required to bring it up to uh, uh, state standards? Is there anything in there which needs to be treated? Uh, Joe, Joe can answer that, but that, that there's there's a nitrate issue at the moment. Yeah, uh, cur 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 currently we run all our flows through a, a brackish water RO facility to remove nitrates. And uh, as the study that, that has been done shows, once we are actually are in full production where we're actually injecting the treated wastewater, the IPR water into the ground and fully extracting it, we anticipate those nitrate levels to be down below the concentration of uh, where we would have to treat it. So uh, we would meet all the requirements, be able to pump it directly out of the water. Uh, as Tim said, at that point, just chlorinate it and uh, you know, and make sure we meet all the water quality goals, but we don't anticipate having to continue to run that RO facility past uh, the point of uh, intermittently while we're still uh, in this testing phase and until such date when we decide that uh, we're going to fully implement IPR and utilize it as one of our main water sources. Does that mean you are planning on doing some nitrate removal if, if, you, if you start extracting groundwater? From, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely still maintain our our old facility, and uh, and again, it will it will probably be multiple years before we implement full IPR because we do have a state water contract, and that's our primary source of water. So, uh, you know, our water source will continue to come from the state water project, and uh, so we won't see those nitrate reductions from injection and extraction because we really get that reduction from injecting this water with no nitrates and extracting and actually flushing this the system having that water there and we we will not be running it in that mode until 
the time comes when we actually need to. You know, uh, something can happen with state water. We could end up going into an extended drought and actually implement this system or uh, – some regulations can change and we can actually wield our state water allotment to somewhere else where it would it'd make sense. But uh, in the short term, uh, we will continue to run our, our brackish water RO facility to meet all our water quality objectives. Okay. Um, is, there, is there a chance, what sort of monitoring for saltwater intrusion do, will we have to do if we uh, implement a uh, the extraction program. Well, well uh, John, uh, this is Tim Thompson again. Um, you know, there are a series of, of wells near the coast, you know, kind of near the existing wastewater plant and to the south a little bit um, that are referred to as the desalination wells. And uh, we've been monitoring those uh, on behalf of the city uh, for, oh, over a year now and tracking both water levels and the chloride concentration as an indicator of seawater intrusion. So that'll continue to happen. The, the long-term monitoring of those desalination wells will continue to be conducted to track what's happening with any potential for seawater intrusion. Um, okay, so, so you, this, you're gonna have too. Yeah. You're gonna monitor that. Uh, let's see, and one last question. Well, actually, two questions. What's spec for the uh, piezometer? Is that a two-inch well or a two, one, inch, one inch well? The, the, the piezometers that we installed uh, are both two-inch two inch casing within the, the borehole. Do they get it written? Do you pull them out when we're done? We, we, could, we can, and we, we're going to preserve them for any future potential needs for the, mo for the moment. Uh, for okay, the and then the mantra... And what's your monitoring well spec? What three inch? I was two inch casing within within the borehole, so that's enough. That's enough capacity, enough size to be able to allow a water level transducer to, to be deployed and to collect regular uh, water level data. And if we need to, we could pull a water quality sample from those wells. Okay, and then the injection well. What's the spec for that? Besides, well, that's, I'm sorry. What size um, pipe for that? Well, we're still working on it. That's part of our what we call our phase three scope of work is to design that full scale injection well. It'll be, you know, probably an eight inch casing, eight to 10, because we need to have size in, within the well for um, both injection tubing, as well as, a, a, as well as a small pump to do redevelopment during injection activity. So it's, it's on that order, but we're still in the process of, of putting together that, that uh, design spec for both the initial well and, and as Eric mentioned, the, the full um, basis of design for the, for the full system. What sort of head are you going to apply? What sort of, sort of head are, are you going to apply to the injection wells? Well, that, that depends on what we learned in our, in our initial testing of, of the first full scale well. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, it's possible that we would have, uh, you know, uh, some number of feet, you know, 10 or 20 feet of head above ground surface at the injection well, but we can design them to, to sustain that, uh, but we need to know what the injection capacity is from an actual test rather than just guessing with the model at this point. But that, that's an option is to have some pressure at the wellhead to be able to get the full rate in. When we look at the wells, we don't, we don't think they need... If we have five or six injection wells, the, the individual flow rates at each well are not that high. Maybe 100 gallons a minute, something on that order, depending on the whole layout and different pieces. So it's not like we're trying to put a huge rates of injection at each of the wells to, to meet the total anticipated demand. So we don't, we don't need to, we want to have any excessive pressure conditions. We, we just use a, Gravity basically to push the water. Is that right? It basically, yes. That that's our default, and, and only if we need to to be able to get the full capacity in would would we have to revert to something like a little bit of pressure at the wellhead. Would it be cheaper to put another well in than a, a pump? Well, we wouldn't be pumping it in. It would be using line pressure from from the distribution line. Okay. We wouldn't be pumping the well water into the well. It'd still be using the pressure from the distribution line. 
Okay. Uh, let's see, then the last question I have, has anyone contacted DTSC's Brownfield section for dealing with uh, issues from the uh, right of ways in the, the treatment plant, in uh, the power plant? And that's not you, that would be some, probably Eric would be the first one to answer that one. Eric? Uh, yeah, we, we have been in, uh, in, good question, we have been in contact with, uh, with the DTSC. Um, there was some activity that was occurring uh, kind of late last year, um, uh, earlier this year uh, around some, some things that were, were going on out at the site. Um, and we have uh, been, been in communication with them and evaluating that situation and, and determined that um, that their planned activities uh, out there um, do not impact our work project. I wouldn't expect that. Uh, are they going to put any conditions on us if if uh, we get the right of way to for inje injecting uh, our treated water there? Um, from DTSC, I, I don't believe so. Okay. That's good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, that's, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have one question. A couple of years ago, when we were initially looking at the Choro Valley, uh, one of the issues that came up was the chrome coming down in that uh, region. And um, I guess in other injection areas around the state, there had been issues with the purity of the water being injected, uh, combining with the uh, the natural elements um, in the, uh, the the soil in the basin, uh, do we see any issues with uh, um, that occurring um, in the uh, the Morro Valley there, um, with either a chrome issue or just the, uh, the the level of purity of the water being injected at that at those levels an excellent question mr mr Dressler. Uh, tim thompson again with gsi uh, part of our um, standard uh, approach towards these types of injection projects uh, and what's included in our phase three scope that eric mentioned previously is to do um, uh, some geochemical analysis of what happens when the, the water quality of the injected water mixes with the native groundwater water quality, as well as the sediments of the aquifer. Um, so, and, and one of the things is surely a hexavalent chromium. Arsenic is another potential uh, element that can be destabilized when you put a different water chemistry into the, into the sediments of the aquifer and it mixes with the native water. So that, that's a piece that we'll do uh, as part of this next phase. Um, and it, it's always been planned to be done uh, and it's important to be done. Um, so it's, it's basically a geochemical mixing model that, that uh, is, is, uh, is conducted to analyze what kind of reactions might occur between the native sediments and then the new water being introduced. So that, that is one thing that's, that's pretty important to, for the city to, to consider you know, down the road a little ways, but looking at what the water quality of the, the, the newly recovered water would be, as, 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 um, as Joe mentioned, you know, after a few years of operations, when you have a substantial amount of recycled water flowing through and mixing in the aquifer, the water quality of the, I'm sort of going the next step beyond your question, actually, the water quality of the recovered water could be slightly different. So we need to understand how much different that would be and if there's any issues with you know, moving that through the existing distribution pipelines in terms of destabilizing any of the natural um, conditions in those pipelines. So that's all part of, 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 of a normal IPR program where you look at the geochemistry of the mixing in the groundwater and then also the chemistry of the water that's then being produced and how much different that is uh, as it gets served to the through the distribution pipelines. All right. So good, good question. Yeah. Um, before we do any more um, questions, Eric, do you have another portion of the presentation to make, or should I open this up to public uh, comment at this time? 
No, that, that was the end of the, of the presentation. Okay, so before we take it back to um, the board, I'll open this up to public comment. So anyone that um, from the public that would like to make comments on this presentation, um, if you are online, then in the Zoom, then just press the uh, raise hand uh, button. And if you're on a telephone, do a star nine in order to raise your hand. Um, and we'll give it a, a moment or two and let uh, these people raise their hand and Zeke uh, will let us know if we have anybody queued up to uh, make public comment. Yes, sir, we have one person online uh, with their hand raised. Okay. And Betty Winholtz, you are online. Thank you, this is Betty Winholtz. I would like to know a little bit about the desal or the um, saltwater intrusion. Um, I'd like to know if our wells that are testing for that right now have already experienced that. And if it's higher in one area of the wells than another. So if you could just go into what are we experiencing now in terms of saltwater intrusion. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Um, Zeke, do we have any additional uh, people in the line that would like to uh, make public comment at this time? No, sir, nobody in the queue at this time has their hand raised. Okay, with that, I'll close public comment and we'll bring it back to um, staff. Um, uh, is there someone that is able to um, respond to uh, Betty's question? Um, this is Dave O'Rourke from GSI. Uh, I know th that there's no issue with, with saltwater intrusion in the city's wells currently. Uh, I, I did see data from the high school wells back in the drought of the late 80s, early 90s, where, you know, they experienced it then. Back then, the city was pumping you know, 500 acre feet a year, more or less, every year. So they were pumping a lot more than they are now. And there was an extended drought. And, you know, the, the, the water quality at those high school wells, the total dissolved solids went up significantly. It dropped back down when the drought ended. But uh, that's just to make the point that it has happened in the past at Morro Bay. We're not talking about a theoretical construct here. But right now, as far as I know, no, there's no issue with that currently. That's correct, right, Joe or Eric? That, that's correct. This is Joe Miller. All right, thank you very much. Um, good question. Uh, let's see, we'll bring it back to the board if they have any additional questions. I'll um, start um, in the order I, I did before. So we'll go back to Chris and see if he has any questions or comments at this point. We're good at this time. Okay, uh, Doug, how about yourself? No, my, my questions have been answered, thank you. Okay, thank you. Tori, you're next in line. Um, I only have one question. This is maybe a little kind of, um, it's not pertaining necessarily water injection, uh, but I'm just, in light of the recent uh, power outages going on with all the fires in California, I'm just wondering, and, and this new WERF project, including, you know, the WERF facility, including injection wells, being probably more energy intensive than uh, current the current system that we have. I'm just wondering, um, you know, are, how, how uh, well, first of all, I'm just wondering if, if, are you aware of any water utilities in the state of California in the last couple of days that have had to go to um, backup power generation in, in light of uh, rolling blackouts to their system? And, you know, you know how critical 
or you know, have they been have they been deployed? Have, have backup generators been deployed to uh, keep the water system running? And you know, therefore, how critical will backup generators be to our system, especially in light of having uh, you know a greater, more energy intensive system pumping the water around, things like that. Yeah, so I can I can answer uh, that question. So you know, as far as knowing any facilities that experience shutdowns in the in the because of the uh, the heat and stuff, I I don't know of any, and I and I follow those groups uh, pretty closely, but uh, not to say that there haven't been. Uh, but as far as uh, you know, our power generation and what we have, uh, the new wharf facility uh, will have an emergency standby generator just as our existing facility does. And all our sewage lift stations uh, have standby generators. You know, the, the, the wastewater side is a, is a little bit more time sensitive as far as uh, making sure your pumps stay on. Uh, the water system, we do have uh, two portable generators that we can take around and, uh, and run our booster pumps to fill the tanks back up. But we do have more leeway on the water side because uh, the water system, once we get it in the tanks, really are ran by the pressure of those tanks, the elevation of the water. So, uh, so when you think about a short-term power outage like uh, PG&E was predicting with rolling blackouts anywhere from one to three hours, you know, our water system would survive that without any standby power uh, because of the water levels that we keep in, in the tanks. Uh, anything above that, we'd run our uh, portable generators. So when you're talking IPR, it's pretty much uh, the, the same thing. You know, we could, uh, you know, stop injecting for two or three hours and it really wouldn't in fact uh, affect our extraction rate. Uh, if uh, at some point the city goes to uh, more reliance on uh, our extraction wells and not so much on state water, uh, we look at doing some sort of, uh, you know, standby generation at the well sites. You know, currently we do not have any backup power at our, at our well extraction sites, and nor do we even have a portable generator to actually hook up to those. So uh, that's something that we'd look at if we uh, deemed IPR and extraction was going to be our main water supply. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Okay, Jan, do you have um, any additional questions or comments? I don't have any more questions, but I do have a comment. I This is not obviously my field that I'm very fluent in, but I did read the report a couple of times and I was very impressed. I understood everything that they were saying and, and I learned a new word, transmissivity. <laughs> and, more, and more than I thought I'd ever needed to know about uh, how long the water was in reten uh, retention in the ground. So I, re I think that it all makes sense. Uh, you came down to the conclusion that you thought the, the western site was the better site, and uh, I followed along and thought that I saw how you came to that conclusion, so that's my only comment. All right, thank you. Um, John, let you finish up. Do you have any additional questions or comments at this time? Um, I had one minor question about um, what I've read is that when you take out all the, the, the you know, this water which we're going to be creating at the wharf is very, it's going to be very aggressive. And are we going to do something to the water so it's not as, as aggressive as it naturally comes out of that plant? Um, and yeah, you know, so if there's stuff in the, the soil air, it's if there's anything which an acid situation can leach out of the the, the soil out there, this this wharf water will do unless it's been uh, specially adjusted. And I was wondering uh, what the plans were or what the the I know we don't have any specific plans, but we should have a kind of conceptual plan of how what we're going to do. Yeah, so just real quickly, I can answer that question. The, um, the treatment plant, part of the treatment plant scope of work is to build um, calcite contactors that are located um, after RO, um, which will um, essentially add, uh, add minerals and, and dissolve solids into the water 
um, to recondition it so it isn't such an aggressive, it isn't as, aggr as so aggressive uh, when it goes back in into the ground to, to mitigate against uh, against that. So that is something that we um, we have included in uh, in the project. Uh, then a question for Joe is: Do we have any iron or, or God forbid, lead pipes in the system which we'd have to be worried about? Uh, I, I would never say that we we don't have any in the system, but uh, again, we're uh, going to be conditioning the water to the to the point where it won't be aggressive and it won't be attacking those. And when we do test for for the aggressiveness of the water when it comes out of the wells, and uh, and currently. We're using RO uh, treatment to remove uh, the nitrate, so that uh, that does remove a lot of the other minerals and stuff. So we use calcium right now and run it through uh, calcium tanks to recondition the water, uh, much like what we're going to be doing at the new facility. Okay, thank you. Okay, Donna. and I do not have any additional, <coughs> excuse me, comments or questions. Um, anything else from any of the board members? Okay, I'd like to thank all of the staff for uh, the presentation. There's no action that we're required to do. Um, our comments are supposed to be forwarded to the uh, city council. So thank you everyone for the good presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is B3, Enhanced Source Control Program and Sewer Use Ordinance Revisions, Morro Bay Municipal Code, Chapter 13.12. Nothing like 45 pages of legalese. <laughs> I, uh, back in the mid 90s, I was on the Morro Bay Municipal Code Review Committee and we spent a year going through word by word of the municipal code. And uh, it's always so much fun reading this stuff. <laughs> I think at that time, with the exception of uh, um, code 17, we, uh, we found like 40 different definitions for the word person. So it was when I hit the word person in your definitions, I thought, oh, there it is again. Okay, so I'll let staff go ahead and give their presentation. Thank you. Do we have a staff? Sorry, sorry about that. I, I, I guess I need to learn to unmute myself um, also. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Rob Leivik here sitting in the dark, uh, it appears. Uh, um, need to get some lights on uh, here. Um, but this is an item that we need to move forward to make some um, changes to the city's municipal code in order to um, uh, better regulate what goes down the drain. And that's a requirement to, um, um, for the use of um, uh, reclaimed water for IPR. And I'm gonna turn it over to, I believe, Lydia to lead us through this discussion. Lydia Holmes from Corolla. Yes, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen here and let me know if you can see it. Yes. Okay, great. So Lydia Holmes, I'm with Crollo. I am working with the program as a uh, permitting lead and as such have been helping out with this sewer use ordinance revision. All right, we'll get started with the presentation. If I can make it all work. Okay, so um, you guys are all aware that the city is investing in the new water reclamation facility. It's about one MGD. There's an extensive amount of conveyance facilities to take that water from its current location and run that east. And then we're building potable reuse facilities. So the previous presentation talked about a lot of this with the injection wells up to 825 acre feet and the advanced treatment. But what um, we're talking about today is that the, the the WRF is designed to augment local water supply. And that's 
a bit of a change from your current system. And so we need to take the measures to be make sure that we're being protective of your new system that's shown here. This is the treatment system. And it starts with this brown box where it's your commercial, industrial, and residential sectors that discharge to the sewer. And so we need to step, make sure that we're protecting all the elements along the way because this system is in the end producing what is going to be uh, your new potable water supply. So the California Division of Drinking Water, DDW, um, has source control requirements for projects just like yours. And I think that was already being touched on um, or in the earlier presentation as well. They require that you administer an industrial pretreatment and source control program, produce effluent and recycled water in compliance with all your permit limits, and to have some elements of this source control to look at fate of contaminants, source uh, investigation and monitoring, outreach, and can a contaminant inventory. So the source control program at Morro Bay will help protect the city's water supply. And that really means that we're starting with protecting the staff and the public. And that's the staff that work at the collection system and treatment plant, Joe's staff. Uh, we wanna be protecting the collection system. We wanna protect the treatment plant processes, be protective of the effluent and biosolids compliance as well as the um, reuse, which is the new supply. So all of these are wrapped into our new source control program. Your current municipal code does not provide the city with adequate legal authority to protect all of these facilities. And that's really um, because you're a smaller facility that was doing ocean discharge. You weren't doing this system of going to potable supply. So, so this, Source control is all about um, being protective of your new system that you're gonna have in place. So the updated sewer use ordinance, which is chapter 1312 of the municipal code, will give the city legal authority to implement a source control program as required by the state. So major changes to the sewer use ordinance include, um, it authorizes the city to issue wastewater discharge permits. It provides monitoring, reporting, and compliance requirements for industrial users, establishes the city's enforcement policies, establishes discharge limits for industrial users, and incorporates the city's existing fats, oils, and grease program, which is really aimed at um, restaurants not causing um, backups in the sewer because of grease clogs. Some of the parameters that will have discharge limits for industrial users are shown here. Uh, when I talked about each of the different areas that we're trying to protect, there's different constituents for each one of those endpoints, whether it be the ocean or for um, public health for drinking water. And so there's different drivers for why we would be establishing limits for industrial users. Some of the activities following the adoption is that all the provision of the sewer use ordinance will be uh, effective immediately. The city will then start to develop discharge permits for their industrial users and businesses. The industries uh, will be permitted within one year. There are two existing industries in town and a potential third that's interested in coming to town. So those will be permitted within the first year and then select businesses will be permitted gradually over the next three years. There's 178 restaurants and 33 commercial businesses that are of a type that we have identified as um, you know, being something that we wanna keep an eye on and, and develop permit limits for. So the implementation will involve outreach to industries, businesses, and residents because everyone in town needs to be part of the solution to protect your future water supply. And so everyone needs to be educated about your system and how to protect it. So next steps for the sewer use ordinance is that there will be a workshop with city council to walk them through the ordinance and any concerns they have. And then there will be two readings of the ordinance at October council meetings. At the first meeting, there will be a first reading and at the second meeting, there will be a second reading and adoption. And I don't have those exact dates yet, but um, they're probably very predictable. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'm, 
done with my presentation, just closing with the image of what this new facility might look like with the Morrow Rock in the background. So I'll open it up to questions at that at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we'll start uh, this time with John. Do you have any questions at this time? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. Okay. Um, so there's 33 commercial building businesses and was it 177 restaurants? Is that how many uh, uh, permitted users we expect to have? Yeah. Uh, are any of them going to be considered uh, non? Basically, they won't. They won't impact the the because of their their history. They won't impact the. Uh, treatment plan, are any of those businesses going to be given a, a, uh, that exception? I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean for exception. So the point is to develop permits and part of the um, the part of the permitting effort is to require that they monitor their discharges so that we can keep track of if there's any constituents in their effluent that is of concern. That's the first step. And then if if there is constituents of concern, then we would start um, a process to make sure that they lower those constituents if they were at a okay. level that wasn't where we want it to be. Do we have any businesses? I think where I read in the thing there were they provide like one, one or two percent of the, the daily flow to the sewer. Do we have any businesses like that? Um, so there's, we talked about that there's two industries in town. Um, so the the industries that actually are, you know, qualify as an industry, we need to permit them. I'm not sure that they're one to two percent of the flow, but they do have discharges that have certain constituents that we are um, interested in. So that's why we need to permit them. Okay. So, and then I assume most of the other 33 are like um, auto repair shops. Is yep. that right? Yes, we have some different categories that of, of industries or, or sorry, businesses that could have the potential of having some issues. And so we want to keep an eye on them and start establishing what we're calling general permits that would lay out, like I said, some reg, you know, regular sampling and um, a, a, it's a method to start the communication and making sure that everyone's aware of their obligation. Okay, and I, I, I guess... Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess the question I've got there is, is, so there is a list you have of the businesses that you're concerned about, is that right? Yes, we did a whole industrial waste survey where we sent out a survey to all the businesses in town um, and the, um, some of them we had to follow up with you know, phone calls if they didn't send us emails back, but we were able to get a lot of information and staff filled in the holes and went out and knocked on doors when they needed to, to, to get information. So we have a pretty good baseline um, of who discharges to your system right now. So is Joe gonna be the POC for this program or is he gonna delegate? Joe is, is in charge of this, and then he has his source control people that will work under him. Okay. Uh, was this, was there a source for the preparation of this uh, ordinance? Uh, did you go to a, I guess, a local government uh, site there to get the basics of it, and then you adapted it? Is that how you prepared the ordinance? Yeah, this is based on standards. So I have Penny Carlo on the line with me. Penny, can you maybe fill in some some answers on that? Hold on. And uh, let's see if I could. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to de detect my camera. It's okay. We can hear you. 
Okay, um, we used the uh, EPA model ordinance that was established by US EPA uh, based on the uh, federal regulations for the National Pretreatment Program. So it is um, language that has withstood the test of time and has been used by uh, publicly owned treatment plants all over the country uh, for decades. So um, we use that as our model and and then we customized it um, as, as we needed to, um, working with Joe and the city attorney uh, to customize it for Morrow Bay. So I, I assume that Department of Drinking Water is kind of on board with the use of this uh, standard. Uh, that's what you started from, is that right? Yes, so, so um, and we didn't really explain this uh, in the presentation, but it was in the um, staff report. So EPA has programs that are mandatory for pretreatment for facilities that are over 5 million gallons a day. So you don't fall within that um, requirement. But as Penny was saying, we're using their guidance documents basically for developing the sewer use ordinance. So it, it is something that the state will be used to seeing. Okay. Uh, BMPs, are, is Joe going to be responsible for that or is that something which uh, Corolla hopes to work on in the future? Are you asking about the BMPs? Um, established in the ordinance for the uh, commercial businesses and the industries? That's right. They'll, they'll be established in uh, permits mm -hmm. with the businesses and the industries. And businesses okay. will need to, uh, the businesses will be a need to implement them in accordance with the permit that they get. So generally what happens, as I understand it, is the city will have a booklet showing the proposed BMPs, is that right? Uh, they will, they have the ordinance that they will share with the businesses and industries and uh, they will also issue permits. But any business coming into town who's new and inquiring about establishing in Morro Bay uh, can look at the ordinance and review that to see what these are, what the requirements are. They can also look at, um, you know, Joe, work with Joe and see what a potential permit would look like. And so what, I, what I read in the ordinance was uh, Joe, there are none at this point, but Joe is, has the option of develop, developing them if he wants to, is that right? Developing permits? No, BMP. BMP. BMPs. Uh, they can't. The city can establish more BMPs if it is uh, determined to be necessary. So Other will than, there? In addition to what's in the ordinance already. I. There was nothing in the ordinance when I read it. I was just so I, that's why I was asking about those. Okay, well, with, um, I, uh, now I understand what you're asking. Um, the ordinance does define uh, BMPs. Um, many of the prohibited standards that are listed in the ordinance uh, will be described in the permit as BMPs. Um, others can be added into a permit um, as appropriate for uh, um, various types of businesses. For example, the um, BMPs for dentists, um, uh, using amalgam separators, et cetera, those BMPs would be established in their permit. Uh, if a if a business um, needs to control the brine from their water softener or their boilers, uh, that would be established in the permit. Those types of BMPs um, will be developed at that time. But the city has full legal authority to establish BMPs as necessary that may not be explicitly defined in the ordinance. But, That's right. the business, but the businesses will see it when they start the, the permit process, is that right? Yes, yes. Right. 
Uh, I noticed that uh, there was no appeal discussed in one of the sections there. Uh, what happens if, if a business doesn't agree with Joe? They, they take it up to the city council or is there a process they'll follow? Um, we do have appeals um, language in here. Uh, they can appeal the permit. The, there are issues uh, there are, you know, they can appeal the permit conditions. Um, they can in the uh, enforcement uh, steps, the various uh, enforcement steps, they um, have opportunity to, um, uh, you know, have a show cause hearing or other hearings in which they can appeal a decision. Okay. Those are, uh, uh, those are back in the um, article um, 10, remedies for non-compliance. Okay. So, 13 and something or other. What was that? I just wondered where to find them. Oh, I see how you got it. Okay. Fine. I'm, I'm, I'm. Now, um, next question I got is: Does Murrow Bay have any um, hazard waste hazardous waste sources in their jurisdiction? Not that we found in the um, inventory that we did. Okay. Uh, I had a question about the fog program. Does the uh, fog program, so the oil and grease, if it were discharged to the uh, sewer system and, and you know, we clean that out so it doesn't clog everything up, is that the major issue that we have with fog oil and grease and the uh, discharges from the restaurants or is there other issues that, which it might cause with the wharf too? The main concern is, is is grease clogs, and Joe can probably elaborate on that if you need more, but that's the main purpose for um, developing permits for the restaurants, is just to make sure that they're properly disposing and handling of their grease. And so there would there would, there'd be no actual treatment issues with the, with the grease other than the fact that you got to separate it out? Yeah. Yeah, and, well, and even at the treatment plant, you know, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, there's no treatment issues. It, it just, it becomes a very costly uh, uh, substance to deal with. So, uh, you know, at the actual treatment itself, it's, it's still a physical separation process, but it, it does wreak havoc to uh, not only the, the pumps to get it there and the pipelines, but the screens and the aeration basins. So uh, it, it is just uh, uh, something that uh, is very costly to deal with and labor intensive. So it's, it's cheap and, and more feasible to deal with it at the restaurants themselves. Okay, so but it's not a matter of hazardous waste per se, it's just a matter of operations. Okay. Uh, no more questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Jan, do you have anything at this time? Yeah, when I read this, I read it as it was my understanding that this was a statement of something that you were going to do because the uh, water, the potable water reuse system requires that you include relevant pretreatment program elements. And so the way I read this was you were going to create this program and let the city uh, be authorized to issue the discharge permits and to establish the, the standards and requirements. And so I agree that the city should be able to do that. And if, if this goes along with our wastewater treatment plant, at this point, I have no questions. I'll be at some of the of the workshops to find out what's going on. Thank All right, you. thank you, Jan. Um, Tori, you're next. Um, uh, 
And first of all, BMP, uh, what, what is that, John, maybe to answer that? Just the standard that we're requiring uh, businesses, for example, with high constituents that we're trying to prevent getting into the system to match that standard? BNP stands for Best Management Practices. And oh. so it's, it is like civil engineer has a standard of care, BMPs is the standard of care for people who discharge to stormwater, to the sewer, things like that. That's how they uh, keep, it, keep a clean site and, and um, don't cause cause problems or okay. contamination. Okay. Well, I guess my, my just a question of clarification then is the permit to the new permit um, uh, ordinances that may uh, be a you know that how do I say it the the permits given to certain industrial producers and and say restaurants as well um, will be more stringent in terms of what they can and cannot put into the system based on um, their own testing of the effluent that they're putting out. Uh, and the permit will not be granted to them unless they meet uh, constituent uh, content. And so if they, they don't meet it, the granted, and they have to do some other mitigation on their own end uh, before they can be given a permit. Is that correct? And um, so do you anticipate uh, businesses who may be high in, uh, you know, affluent con constituents that we don't want, they, they're gonna be looking around for uh, you know, some new filtering process to their current practices that they're going to have to find out on their own to implement. Um, you know, I, so the, the, the actual ordinance is stating a, a standard that the, these businesses have to live up to, but how they actually do it uh, is on their own, their own, they have to figure it out themselves. And, um, uh, there's there's nothing they just have to in order to get the permit they have standard and, and how many um, do, do you foresee that being let's just say for a number of businesses is is, is that going to be a a major ex, expenditure in addition to the permit or um, so uh, so, Tori, I, I can kind of start off on this one, and I think uh, Lydia can probably back me up a little bit if I if I start get going down the wrong path. But uh, uh, when we talked about uh, the stringent requirements, those really will uh, deal with the industries. And as we said, there's two industries in town. Both of them are, you know, major industries that are in other towns, so they've dealt with these types of regulations before. Uh, they know how to deal with it. We're definitely gonna reach out and work with them, but uh, they do have the expertise in house. And uh, and it's not that, that they don't wanna comply. They, they they just say, what is gonna be your standard? Because it's a, their businesses, they wanna make money. So, uh, but they, they definitely understand what it takes. And those will be the ones that will get strictly regulated because those will have an impact on water quality. When we talk about best management practices and the majority of our businesses are the restaurants. So those are the ones that, you know, they, they have an impact. They don't have a strict water quality impact because we're dealing with fats, oils, and greases, but we do want them to comply with, you know, the, the, the costly stuff. You know, it just, it just makes sense to separate your grease and have a grease can and not pour that stuff down the drain. So we're right. gonna be asking them to do best management there, and we're going to ask them to keep some records on, on how you're disposing of your grease. But the strict enforcement, it really is geared more towards the industries to making sure it doesn't have water quality impacts. Okay, that's that's good. Just a question would be, is there any, has there any, has anyone in... 
You're breaking up there. Reusing Sorry. fats and. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've been having internet connection problems. Um, that's all right. I'm fine. Thank, thanks for that. I'm good. Yeah. And, and I and I think I caught part of what what you were saying about reusing the fats and stuff. Uh, I know bigger cities uh, they they do go around and they actually require you know they have the pumper trucks where they pump it and and they take it to uh, digester facilities and create biogas with it. You know. Uh, yeah. That's... Digesters love that stuff, right? So uh, yeah. I'm sure the, the the pumpers in this area that where we have full grease separators on some of the bigger restaurants that require a the uh, outside company to come out and pump out their grease. I'm sure that they're taking it to some sort of recycling facility. Uh, uh, I haven't followed up with that in this area, but I know around the Sacramento area, they, they definitely do. And they put it into digesters and create uh, biogas and run buses and, and stuff on it. So. Exactly. And then we have a biodigester in San Luis now. So so I'm sure lot, lots of it probably does end up winding, wind up going in that direction. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, Doug, um, are you ready? Do you have any questions or comments? Hello? We hear you. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm uh, definitely in favor of this. Um, you know, my experience in Visalia, you know, which is a city of 140,000 people, you know, the city comes out every year to look at, you know, my, my drains. And, uh, uh, you know, I put it, I just put in a simple grease trap because I have a, you know, a plastic business and, of course, plastic floats, and I don't want that going to the city sewer plant. So I just, I trap them all and scoop them and keep, the, keep my sewer effluent clean. Uh, but right down the street, there was a fellow who had uh, a mirror coating plant. It was an Italian company, and they were dumping silver down the drain. And it wasn't long before the city kind of tracked back that effluent. And uh, so, I mean, what this whole thing means is that the city is going to be watching, certainly for new businesses. Really, I, I think that's the issue because Joe has already, you know, mentioned he's, you know, he's got a handle on the current, you know, the major industrial discharges. So it's really for what would be any any new companies coming in, and they're going to have to fill out a questionnaire on what their discharges would be. So uh, I, this is just standard for any any city, and I think uh, I'm just in favor of it. Okay, that's my comment. All right, thank you, Doug. Chris, do you um, have any questions or comments at this time? Yeah, just briefly, I understand the, the policy and everything there. Just in the analysis, are we expecting there to be any local businesses that are going to see uh, between what you're monitoring now and the new program um, is there going to be some barrier of entry, you know, financially that's going to prohibit them from continuing their business? Based off the baseline you're looking at, we kind of know what businesses they do. We, we know what um, they're disposing of or close to it. Is there any that are on your watch list that you're just afraid without an exception being made that they're going to have a tough time remaining in business to, to adhere to this? Joe, do you want to take this or you want me to? <laughs> so I think, as Joe said before, the, it's the industries that are going to definitely, um, we're going to be taking a hard look at as as they're getting permitted. And as Joe already alluded, they, they probably will need to put in some pretreatment. Um, the goal certainly is not to drive any businesses out of town or, you know, prevent the community from having local businesses. So, you know, it's always a balance between, you know, when you're regulating to try to find that careful balance. Anything else, sir, Chris? So was that an answer or was a statement? <laughs> I, I, I get what the goal is, right? But in raw practical application, are we faced with possibly uh, bringing a very large detriment to the businesses in our town with this policy. 
and, and Penny, feel free to jump in or Joe. I don't think that there's going to be a big detriment. At, you know, we haven't started the permitting process with the industries yet, um, but we are starting to you know collect data and and look at. Um, what their quality is so that we can evaluate what's needed to be done. So it's an evaluation in process. And, and again, this is all about, the sewer use ordinance is all about giving the city the tools to be able to do the regulation needed. The decision on how you want to actually write those permits is to be made down the road. And, and I can tell you that the, the two industries that we do have in town, uh, even before we started working on this ordinance, have been in close contact with me and uh, and the staff uh, that do the inspections, wanting to know what when some regulations are going to come. Because again, these are not businesses that are, you know, uh, special to Morro Bay. They're nationwide businesses. They uh, they have other locations in other towns. They know that they have other treatment stuff. Now, do they want to spend the money? Of course not. You know, uh, you know they're they're they, but they they do want to be good neighbors and good community residents. So they have been actually very good to work with, and they and they want to know uh, what it's going to take, and you know about you know if it's going to be too restrictive for them, you know, to just jump right to meet those requirements, what other alternatives do they have? And we've been working with them. And, and like I said, it's been a great working relationship with the two industries that we're currently dealing with. And uh, I have every indication that it's going to continue that way. And I know you've been very transparent. So is, I just wonder, is there a, is there a time frame that they're going to, uh, you know, have a chance to get up to speed? You know, obviously, I believe you've, you've already been, again, very transparent in the guidelines that we have currently. But is there a, is there a time allotted for them to be, uh, uh, to get their chance to be brought into compliance, you know, or is it a, a very short time frame that we're going to be asking the constituents that we're concerned with, uh, we believe that we could give them some time. Uh, they, they definitely do have an impact on our treatment process, so we wouldn't want to give them a, a, a lot of time, but uh, uh, enough time to where it wouldn't be a detriment to their business. So uh, we definitely have looked at different phased approaches or doing different type of treatment at and dealing with their stream at the new the wharf facility. Uh, so we are evaluating those options uh, closely with them. We've been at their sites uh, sampling directly, and uh, we're still classifying that and, and working through that process. Okay, that's all I had. Appreciate the answers. Thank you, Joe and Lydia. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, I only have a couple questions. One was, you know, a couple years ago, we expanded our... Um, and redefined the uh, sewer use fee schedule um, based on the different types of uh, materials going in, um, made it more refined. Is this going to have any impact on the uh, fee schedule, you know, making adjustments to that on different industries, or this is just going to give us the opportunity um, to uh, deal with that as it comes along. So this really doesn't, I, I believe you're referring to the strength, what we charge. Yes. You know, and, that, and that deals more with, you know, the organic matter that's in it, you know, the, the BOD and what it's going to cost us to actually treat their waste. This, uh, this ordinance deals more with stuff that we don't, want to actually end up at the wastewater treatment plant. We want to head it off at there. So the expense really would be for the more regulated constituents on the business to remove them before it ever uh, turns into the waste stream. So okay. the, the actual expense, the increase that, uh, that we implemented with our last uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, rate yeah, uh, rate uh, schedule was uh, an actual permit fee. So they will be. We'll start to see permit fees 
uh, with it, and that will cover actually our staff's time to actually go out and do their annual inspections. Okay. Um, the last item is just very small um, on third on just about the last page. Let's see what is it? Ninety four of ninety five page. 13.12.1165 on the collections. It talks about bi-monthly utility bill. We have monthly utility bill. Is that right? We do have a monthly utility bill, so. Well, that should be modified. Yep. Just <laughs> tiny little thing. <laughs> um, okay, uh, at this time, I'll open it up for public comment. And before we bring it back to the board, so I'll let Zeke let us know if there's any um, anyone in the queue to uh, have public comment on this item. If you are on the computer, use the raise hand button. And if you're on the telephone, do the uh, press nine or the star nine in order to raise your hand. Zeke, do you see anyone there? Yes, sir. We have one caller, uh, and Betty Winholtz, you are on, on the line. Thank you. Um, this is Betty Winholtz. Um, I have one question, and that is, is there is the Regional Water Quality Control Board or any other state agency have um, review over what ordinance uh, ends up being approved? Thank you. Okay, and Zeke, you say there's no one else in the queue? They're in the queue, but nobody else with their hands raised at this time. Okay, then we'll close um, public comment on this item and bring it back to the board. Uh, do we have any final questions or comments from the board? Um, or let, let's see, first I'll let staff answer that, uh, Betty's question, if they uh, are able to. So I'll, I guess I'll take it, Joe. <laughs> so um, the way a potable reuse project is permitted is um, we refer to DDW, that's Division of Drinking Water. They have certain review and approval rights. Um, the final review and approval is through the regional board. So the, the regional board will have the, um, you know, will be issuing permits. So in a sense, yes, while it's a requirement of DDW, the regional board does have some authority. And as I mentioned before, um, this is a little bit of a different situation than larger cities because you are, you fall below that EPA um, limit of 5 million gallons a day. So um, the requirements are a little unclear what's required for a smaller facility, but we're trying to meet all the intent of setting up a pretreatment and source control program that meets all the needs. And so hopefully the state will agree with us that our program is thorough. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see, one last chance for board members. Uh, rather than just going down the line, does anyone have any questions they want to just jump in? Uh, yeah, I kind of like to ask a question whether um, the constituents were concerned about our solvents or corrosives. I'm not sure what that and, question is. Uh, Joe? Is Joe Miller there? Uh, I'm here. What was that, John? I, I didn't catch the question. Um, do you... Uh, you got two industries which have constituents you're con concerned about. Is it corrosive solvents or, uh, you know, what sort of stuff are we worried about? And are we going to brief the brief city council on those industries so they know what, what they're touching? City Council will definitely be briefed uh, as, as we move forward. Uh, what we're concerned of, about is stuff that really will affect the treatment process and can affect the water quality. Uh, I wouldn't really classify either one of them as a solvent or a corrosive. Uh, 
Uh, one definitely is, is corrosive, but uh, that's not really how it would impact our treatment process. So I think that's the so best just, response for that. It, is it water chemistry that we're concerned about then? Uh, it, it is uh, water chemistry. Its impact on the, the on the treatment processes, the membranes themselves, how it reacts to the membranes, because uh, okay. our, our process is very membrane intensive uh, through different uh, phases. So, what sort of things uh, are detrimental to the membranes? Uh, Lots of things. It can follow the membranes. Basically, if it's impermeable, it can uh, create scaling on the membranes. Uh, it can uh, impact uh, the, the pH itself, can impact the, uh, the biology and the treatment process. So uh, a, a big range. And then, uh, then you also have constituents that can actually pass through, potentially pass through the, the treatment process in, in some form or on another. So. So, and both of these industries have things which, which fall in those categories then? They, they have, they, they definitely have things that would have an impact on our treatment process. Okay. I just sorry. so I'd, yeah, I'd be interested to find out what those impacts were, but other than that, I don't have any problems with what I've seen then. Thank you. All right, any other board members with a last minute question or a concern? Okay, I'd like to thank staff for a good presentation and I'm sure this took a lot of work. I know legalese is not easy to do. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to the next item on the agenda, C3, but or C, which is future agenda items. Um, it's listed as pavement management plan. Uh, Janine, are there any other um, items that you see? Or Rob, I'm not sure who would be answering this question. No, I thought we had to provide a recommendation. Um, Yes, I believe this one does have an action um, that we're requesting on it. Okay, yes, yeah. staff recommends the board provide input regarding the sewer use ordinance. So the comments that we have is input or do we need to simply um, recommend it as presented? So I'll leave that to the board. Um, whether you want to take a formal motion or we just forward your, your comments on to city council. If someone would like to make a recommendation or a, a, a motion um, to uh, forward it with our comments. I make a motion that we forward the comments on to city council. Is there a second? Well, second. Clarification from staff: We forward on the staff uh, the recommended sewer use ordinance with your comments. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, it's been moved by Jan, and was it John seconded it? Did, did you? Yes. Second? Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's do a roll call on this one. I'll let uh, Janine call everyone off. Board member Erlinson? Yes, I. Board member Irwin? Yes. Board, mem board member Goldman? Yes. Board member Biles? Yes. Board member Rogers? Strong, yes. Chair Deschler? Yes. Motion passes 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With um, then back to uh, future agenda items, do we see anything else um, that will be? Is the pavement management plan probably going to be on the September? Uh, agenda and do we see anything else that would be placed on the September agenda at this time? 
Um, will work well of course the director's report as usual and then the pavement management plan it's quite an extensive um, redraft of our existing pavement management plan so um, we will get that to you ahead of time so that you have a chance opportunity to um, uh, review it well ahead of uh, next meeting and uh, spend uh, the bulk of the next meeting on that pavement management plan all right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, staff. Rick, uh, UGP. Rick, before we adjourn, I'd just like to uh, address Tori's question from earlier tonight on the uh, PCOs, if I could. Go right ahead. So, yeah, so uh, Tori, you had asked on the, on the PCOs how many and what was the dollar amount for the design yes. portion. So, uh, yeah. Currently, there's 44 uh, executed uh, project change orders uh, for a total of about $7.5 million. And uh, okay. there, there's actually a detailed breakdown of that in the war quarterly report that went to city council on the 11th. So it's part of the agenda packet on the 11th. And there's a short de description of each one of the PCOs there that have been approved. So you can find it there. It also went to CFAC at their uh, previous meeting. And it's in okay, section, so section 3.5 of that report. And that's the August 11th? It's, uh, it's actually the quarterly report for uh, July 20th. Oh, correct. It's on the August 11th uh, city council meeting it went. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Yep. Seven million for you. All right. Thank you, Joe. And again, thank you everyone for participating in the meeting tonight and the members of the public. And we will now adjourn to our regular meeting to be held on September 16th, 2000. Hey, uh, Rick. Yes. Wait a second. Okay. Uh, this is Doug. This is Doug Rogers. I thought we had a chance to make a comment on future agenda items. And I, I wanted to say that, you know, of course, the, the city work plan, you know, I, I've asked for that since, you know, our meeting, um, in, you know, in February. Uh, the other thing, of course, with the Wayfair signs, I'd like to see what's going on with that because we've all seen the, the COVID signs going up all over the city. So the Wayfair signs, you know, I can't imagine that that's a, such a big deal, but I think we're losing a chance at some potential tax revenue. And I'd like to add, um, the seagulls have a way of climbing in trash cans and pulling garbage out, which blows all over the parking lot <laughs> in any windy place. And I, I know in Santa Barbara, they have trash can covers, which I'd like to you know, discuss that. What can we do about it? Because it's, it's just another nuisance and maybe it's a simple solution. So those would be my items I'd like to add to the next agenda, please, yeah, if possible. Sure. Okay, thank you for the suggestions. Um, a lot of the items that fall onto the agenda often deals with staff time availability. Um, I'll, I'll let staff uh, take those into consideration and I would appreciate it if um, staff would get back to me prior to the next meeting um, on what availability of, uh, you know, staff time to uh, research and work on those items. Is that something that's possible there, uh, Rob? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, because yeah, it, it, there's a lot of things that we could really discuss at these meetings. Um, and I know that staff time is uh, a huge consideration of uh, preparing for um, items to be placed on the agenda. And uh, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, so thank you, Doug, for bringing that back up. You'd mentioned that at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, with that, I will adjourn at this time to our September 16th meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.